I come from theater where that's the bread and butter, where you use the audience, not just to sit back and enjoy it, although that's part of it, but you use that to also continue to refine the material and battle test it and see how far you can push it. And, you know, the, the audience, in, the audience has made me the writer that I am. Welcome to another episode of the Philosophers Movie Talk Show. I'm Chris Bush. I'm Dean Slider. On the Philosophers, we talk about film and philosophy with the people who make and who love the movies. And we're really delighted to have on today's episode as our guest, writer, director, actor, John Polono, uh, whose new film, Small Engine Repair, is just that we're going to talk about, as well as some of his uh, other work, current and future projects. And, and uh, John, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, guys. We both had a chance to watch your movie, Small Engine Repair. Don't want to give anything away. This is the story of three lifelong buddies in Manch Vegas, yeah. New Hampshire. <laughs> to, to give a little bit of the setup of the film and just share a little bit of the history of the thing. It started as a play, correct? Sure. Yeah. So it started out as a late night play at a theater company that I co-founded with uh, my wife, among other people in Los Angeles, and sort of took off, uh, got transferred a lot in LA, ran for almost a year, and then it ran in New York. It's run all over the country, all over the world at this point. And John Bernthal, who was in the original cast with me, he and I, you know, we met through the play and became really close collaborators. And we sort of been shepherding this project for a long time. And the, the adaptation of the movie was sort of it updated due to, you know, reflecting current things. And then, uh, yeah, and then we made it. And uh, just in time for COVID, so, <laughs> which kind of sucked. But uh, yeah, so here we are. I mean, it's a, it's a passion project. It's a, it's a labor of love. We're really happy about it. It's, uh, like I said, started out as a play and was, uh, yeah, just sort of evolved, which I'm sure we're going to be talking more about that whole process. But uh, it's sort of, a, you know, I think it's like, to me, it's a drama disguised as a really dark comedy, um, and it has uh, thriller elements to it, but it's all, like, my favorite theater has a deeply resonant theme to it, and really is, you know, intention is to make you think and, and really have the material reflect back on the audience and, in a visceral way. So that's what the play did, and then the movie, in my opinion, sort of amplifies that even, so... But it's still entertaining, hopefully. <laughs> the story follows uh, Frankie, Packy, and Swain, three lifelong friends, working class uh, yeah. fellows in New Hampshire, and they reunite after some years. And um, it's it's really it's that it's that buddy movie, but it's also I think a morality tale about the uh, yes. the hazards of the of the of the internet and social media. I won't say anything more than that. But yeah. um, uh, I was thinking, you know, I knew it started as a play. But it didn't feel theatrical or stagey. And there are lots, quite a few movies I've seen that do. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, you know, Night in Miami, which I enjoyed, but it felt like a stage production set to film. And yours did not. Yours felt very cinematic, which I appreciate. Well, you know, ironically, One Night in Miami was written by one of my closest friends, and his play was produced the year after Small Engine at the same theater. And look, I think with Small Engine Repair, we had the opportunity to lean more into sort of the visceral stakes of the moment um in one night in miami the stakes are so they're they're beautiful and i mean i love that movie and i i i hear your your feedback on that i really you know i think that that movie similar to small under repair the joy in that is the is the conversation afterwards and the continuing to talking about it and and you know, I'm so intimate with the One Night in Miami material and seeing what he did to sort of open it up. Mine, mm -hmm. I kind of went a different way. I mean, I, I I zoomed in more into the the family and 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 sort of doing that. So so it's interesting. I I mean, I I love that you've seen both of them. I hope you know people do, and I think it's just so crazy that we had you know those movies, those plays were both produced at our theater company within a year apart. And, oh, know, interesting. Were, I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, it's interesting you say that. So I, I think to me, the, the biggest challenge in, in the adaptation was to say what works in the, in the play. The play was 
like for a number of reasons we can get into it i don't know it's it's very very detailed but basically the late night plays have a had a certain requirement which was the main state the play that was playing there was a sunset limited by cormac mccarthy and it's like a dilapidated apartment building it's a two-hander it's a great play so the late night ones it's like okay they leave they their plays done at 10 05 so you have about 15 20 minutes to attach your set to that set you got to use their light scheme and all that stuff so small under repair was crafted with those limitations which is lights up you know, an 80 minute one act play and then lights are down. So all of the drama, everything had to happen in one continuous sort of master scene. And it became very immersive. It became very, you know, the exposition was had to be very painfully put in there. So it wasn't just like stop. And then it's like a slow burn of a thing. So I, I really tried to leverage what was working in the play and one of the most consistent comments we got about the play no matter where it was was I forgot I'm watching a play that people were like I just I felt like I was hanging out with these guys like it, so then I said okay the movie should have some genre elements of the hangout movie which is what we've you know a subgenre that we're kind of into that and then it would obviously take a take a dark turn but kind of leveraging all that stuff you know in in terms of the first act was most of the stuff that was referred to off stage i just sort of dramatized and, and opened up the first act the biggest thing being that uh, Sierra Bravo's character, Crystal, was not in the play. There were no women in the play. Mm. But having Sierra and 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 um, Jordana's characters be, you know, huge characters in the movie and, and having that opportunity, those are the biggest things. But but the stakes and the in the life and death struggle of it was just amplified in the movie, which I think made it more cinematic. So I think we had that to our advantage. John, taking a, a step back to the big sure. picture, I, I have to tell you, I loved, loved this film. I just thought it was a beautiful piece. And I was particularly um, moved by the way you took that, the, the language of these, you know, working class New England guys and I mean, between your writing and the just the superb acting, you really made yeah. poetry out of it. Well, thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. I think that, you know, I've always loved dialogue, you know, coming from the theater, that's your sort of special effect is how people talk and act. And I just love the way people talk and regional uh, growing up in that area which I know you guys are from Long Island, it's the same kind of thing. Like there's a certain rhythm to the language, especially in the Northeast. There's a certain dark, funny sensibility that New Englanders have, maybe because it's cold all the time and the foul language and all that, but it's really getting underneath what it is. Uh, I, is it okay to swear on your podcast? Um, we, we've got uh, a Cracker Jack editor. If, if <laughs> oh no, I was gonna say like, <laughs> yeah. because for, for example, goddamn, goddamn right it is okay. <laughs> when people drop f bombs in the area that I grew up with, there's a whole variety of it. You know how, like, uh, in the same in New York, Eskimos have eight ways to describe right. snow. Right. It's like the f bomb means so many different things. Right. You know what I mean? And it was funny coming out to California because people get so offended and they don't know how to do it. But I'm like, where I'm from, you know, you can say f you. Yeah. See, I'm trying not to swear. Right. And you're like, I love you, but shut up. You know, there's such a variety to it. So it was really taking a deep dive in that. And, you know, to be honest, because it was a late night play, I got to be a lot more bold in terms of being unfiltered. I always looked at this thematically as like a feminist story from the point of view of these rough men that are exploring those themes. And I was like, it would be really challenging and interesting to have these men talk in a completely unfiltered way. Like, how it is when the door is shut and no one's in the room, how that, how they interact and you can't hold back, but I, you know, the play. And I think the movie to your point does not spoon feed it. And it's expecting the audience to be intelligent enough to really understand what's going on. But more importantly, to realize that this is how a lot of people still communicate. This is how a lot of, a lot of people are. And you gotta like, you gotta go deeper than that. But I think the effect that the play always had and the movie does is, you know, about a half hour in, even if you don't talk like that, people are like, ease back. Like, come on, give me a beer. I can, you know, let's talk shit. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. You know, there's there's one line in the film that for me struck a, a very personal chord when when the guys start talking about one of the guys starts talking about 
the Red Sox, the, right. you know, the, the notorious World Series of 1986. Six. 86, um, yeah. And, and, and another guy says, what is this, an effing Ken Burns documentary? Right. <laughs> uh, as it happens, my wife, Yafa Larea, is a documentary editor who oh, worked wow. with Ken Burns on the baseball documentary. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> And, and she used to tell me about, and at that time, you know, she was the, that whole, Ken's whole Florentine films are all, they're all in residence up there in uh, Walpole. Yeah. Um, and, and my wife used to tell me about just the strangeness of living near the, the Vermont, New Hampshire border. Because the cultures were so different, you know. So different. I mean, to stereotyping a little bit, but but you know, Vermont was the the Birkenstock, yeah, you know, Whole Foods uh, culture, totally. and and New Hampshire is these guys. Yeah, live free or die is the motto of New Hampshire. You know, yeah. what I mean, it's like uh, yeah, you know, my, I mean, most of my family's still there. You go visit; it's exactly what you're talking about. I don't when, know what when, it is. Whenever, whenever I see one of those license plates, I I want to rephrase it as "live free and or die." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Live, well, live people free. have co-opted that phrase for many yeah, different live reasons. free then die <laughs> exactly <laughs> i wanted to ask uh, other films have you know tried to capture the uh the um kind of the cadences and the language of uh you know working class new england south you know south southy um, yeah if you as you watch those films are they are they like the fighter um the town you know, the town um Mystic River, you know, others, are they, were they, were they instructive for you coming oh, along or? Totally. So uh, that's a really good question. So I feel like regionally as a kid growing up, there were never movies in that area, not even really Boston. It was all New York and it was, you know, LA and all that stuff. <clears throat> so when the first few Boston movies came out, we were all defensive about them. Like that's not exactly perfect how we talk and do it. And then it became like, you know, everybody's Southie. So Good Will Hunting came out, which obviously is from those guys from that area. And you're kind of like, okay, it's cool. It became its own sort of thing. The problem is when Hollywood would usually do anything New England, it would have that Southie accent, which is a very specific thing, you know? And then I, but I, I think some of those movies are incredible. Like Gone Baby Gone blew me away when I saw mm. that. And, you know, Mystic River too, I think captured so much of that, uh, the town, you know, but those, again, those are more Boston things. I had not seen anything do sort of this specific part of New England, of New Hampshire, to me, was kind of new and kind of fun to do. But it's sort of, I mean, look, there's no question when the play is done, like in the Midwest at some small edgy theater, they're just watching Goodwill Hunting and they're co-opting that accent, you know. But in, in our movie, being from there and having this guy, Tim Monick, who's like one of the best dialogue coaches out there and having this caliber of actors who were like, super into it they got super specific but like it's also interesting because the truth of it is and i'm sure it's the same in long island is like you have a family of say six people one person could have like a ridiculously strong accent that person's sister could have no accent the other person has a regional so my where i grew up my neighborhood my dad who's from queens my mom who's from rhode island and has that weird pawtucket accent and then you grew up with people who have the weird, you know, the new, the main accent mixed with the Manchester, mixed with all of that. So it, it's it's fascinating how different that dialect is. I love it. I mean, I I, I wanted to ask you a little bit um, sure. too about your uh, your 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 players, John Bernthal and Shea Wiggum are two of my favorite supporting actors. They're just I, when I saw that they were in this, I thought, oh yeah, this is going <laughs> to be. You know, I don't. I hope John's writing is good. I hope yeah. the thing is great, but I know I'm going to enjoy it because they're always good at everything I see them in. And you mentioned John was in your play, but, you know, how did you score Shay? And was it like, uh, you know, you were playing with the big boys on the, in, yeah, in I mean, look, the first acting roles? In totally. Film. I mean, look, I've done a lot of theater. So majority of my my sort of experience is theater and, you know, in TV, you know, guest stars. So I know, uh, you know, things like that. So I know how to stand in front of a camera, but to me, the deepest dive acting was has always been theater. I mean, the way theater is, is it's kind of like you're getting a, I don't care what actor you are, typically theater, you're like pushing yourself. 
and then you get a role in TV and, you know, it's like you're in the gym, you know, you're bench pressing 350 pounds and then you show up on a TV set. They're like, could you move that 80 pound weight? And you're like, sure, you'll do it 50 times. But you're like, you, you can do so much more. And that's why people always go back to the theater. It's so challenging and it's so uh, such deeper work, typically, unless you're on the top of the call sheet and your characters are doing really, you know, interesting stuff day in and day out. Um, so John was obviously in the original production and we hit it off. And John is a producer on it. So uh, the good, the great thing about John Bernthal is he accumulates people who love him because he will, he's a real dude. And like his, you can't deny that. So when he works on a movie or a TV show, the people he works with fall in love with him. And they're like, I'll do anything for that guy. Cause he'll do anything for those pe the people that he cares about. So Shay is one of those people. And when he gave Shay the script, Shay loved the script and, you know, Shay's incredible and he's done has such a huge variety of work, but he had never done anything quite like this. It's a it's it's a chat. It was a challenge to him. And obviously, I think he hit it out of the park, but he plays a lot of heavies. He plays a lot of like dark kind of effed up characters. Yeah. Packy's all heart and he's a very layered, complicated guy. And, and, and Shay was just like, OK, I want to do that gentle. You know, he's the beta male. He He's very intelligent. He's very tragic. So he had all those layers to do. So I think it was very attractive for him in that regards. But again, it's because he knew John and John vouched for, for the material, vouched for me. And then we just kind of hit it off. And we, we really rehearsed the movie very similar to a play. So we spent so much time together at the table, just going over the script, answering questions, I adjusting, you know, I, I ended up, I just rewrote so much stuff for him and the stuff we discovered and taking our time with that. So by the time we started shooting, we were all like truly, best friends um but yes that's how that's how we got shay is 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 seeing him and knowing this is a funny deep actor and and he could pull this off um yeah and he did but i i, I think this character's a different flavor for him conversely you know bernthal who was so close in the development of this and and you know it was also subverting the expectations of what a John Bernthal character is too. And so we get to play against a lot of the type uh, that of characters those two usually play, which was really fun. You know, the first, what is it, maybe two thirds of the film mm -hmm. um, before the plot takes a turn, uh, I kept feeling, th this is like a European film. This is yeah. like, a, like a quiet, um, uh, you know, maybe, you know, f f French or Italian new wave, yeah. uh, you know, character study. Um, and and we, we just really get the way these people, we get these people's hearts and we get some little domestic uh, uh, crises will come along and then mm -hmm. everyone takes a drink and it's over. And it was great on that level. If that's all that had happened, I was perfectly fine with the film. Now, the fact that then some more plot driven stuff takes over in the last third, that was that was a big surprise and also fine. It, that was like mm -hmm. for me, that was like, OK, now now we're walking into another room with it. Yeah, I mean, by design, I think that's what it was always like to get an audience. And again, this is sort of taking the DNA of the play and just deepening it in terms of the film was to get an audience really comfortable and, and get the characters so that when we get to more morally gray area, it's my intent is to be more impactful viscerally as well as thematically, as well as walking out, really having it get under your skin and stick with you. And if they were just sort of, you know, Brechtian archetypes that you never really felt connected with, yeah. it wouldn't have been as impactful emotionally you know that's really what it was is it was like to be emotional and to have something that sticks with you and you know if you watch the film again i think what's fun about making it was always that a lot, the breadcrumbs are hidden in plain yes. sight so yes. once you know what it is if you rewatch it i think you'd have a different experience yes. and probably have more fun um overall you know not uh, to me it's like some of my favorite movies even some on that list i watch and i'm like terrified and then i'm like because I get like really into it. And then when I see it again, like for example, the first time I saw Reservoir Dogs, mm -hmm. you know, years after it was out, I watched the VHS. I mean, I was sweating in the back of my neck. I was very disturbed by the movie. <clears throat> then I watched it again with friends, with guys. And I was like, 
experienced it through them and enjoyed the shock that they had and then i just started watching it again and again and it's then you then i realized how funny it is and how subversive it is and clever so yeah. i tried to design something like that that each time you watched it your reaction would and the visceral reaction you would have would be somewhat different but a lot of that is lulling you into a certain thing before you take that turn uh, one one um artistic decision that was made in the process of of going from the stage play to the film. I mean, always the, you know, you've got the basic challenge of to how much do we open it up? Right. And I would, I was, per, per, I particularly noticed the scenes where uh, each of the guys tells one or at least one story, yeah. which then as he's telling the story, we hear it in voiceover and we see it enacted. And which I was guessing in the in the those stories were all in the the play. And I could very well see the film done without I thought the the, the enactments were fine. But I felt like, but you don't need them. Mm. Because the right the, the writing is so strong and the the actors were so strong that it, it, you know, it could also have been very interesting to just have them summon the right. the scene with in the dialogue in the telling was it was yeah. there any consideration of doing it that way yeah i mean i certainly shot most of it um other than the packy one which i was like i just felt you had to see that um because it was sort of the point of it but to me it was all about several things the most sort of nuts and bolts thing was like opening it up because you're in that shop so much and you don't want to have fatigue and you want to have insight into them but I tried to make each of the stories so reflective of the characters and more importantly the theme of the story and having an audience realize how subjective the storytelling was and like for example Swain always like you know hanging out and having all this stuff but like he's lonely like his friends don't really like him it's sort of pathetic it's this sort of trying that on you know it's sad Mm -hmm. And, you know, then obviously Frank's story, which he's trying to, you know, lure these guys in deeper and make them comfortable, but realizing that his sort of damage is so profound, he can't even avoid it. And then with Packy, it was very much that I, I wanted an audience to viscerally see that. And then again, realized how trauma, how traumatic these guys are. It's like a lot of the cycle of the violence that I felt like you had to see. But, you know, I, I totally hear you. I think that would have been interesting. I think that would have made it even more like a European art film. And it was more <laughs> just to say, open it up, make it visually interesting and continue to seize the, the language of film more so than mm -hmm. stage, make it more cinematic. Um, you know, whether or not it would have been better without it, I just felt it was more of a movie to do it this way. But certainly I think what you bring up is, is a, was a very interesting dilemma to consider. And, you know, I definitely edited it more one way than the other and tried to do it. I just ultimately- I it. loved actually the flashback scene, Packy's flashback scene mm -hmm. that he's re re remembering, recounting right. with, the, with, with young Frankie and young Sueno, but it's adult Shay. Yeah, <laughs> Shay Wiggum as an adult with the two right. little kids. That oh, was, I know that was uh, that worked out really well. That was good. That was such an interesting choice. Now, I want to ask you too: in getting the thing made, was there ever any pressure on you that okay, you can direct, but you can't play Frankie, or you can play Frankie, but you can't direct, or did you were you holding the reins the whole time? Um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough that. Oddly, the first the second reading we ever had was the night I met John Bernthal and Noah Rothman, who ended up being my manager and is a producer on it. They both met him that night. So Noah really shepherded this. You know, I'm prime, I'm a screenwriter primarily is how I make uh, my living now. Um, and for me, it was this was a labor of love. It was a passion project. I would be taking time out of my sort of trajectory of my career in that way to do it. And I just said, look, I'm going to put it all on the table. And that was always my intention. I think because I had performed the play in extensively New York and in LA, and most of the investors in the film had seen me perform in it. So they knew what they were getting. And in terms of my vision of it, Rick Rosenthal, who was you know, probably the lead producer in this, he had directed Bad Boys, a bunch of other stuff. He has worked with actor directors before and he enjoyed it and was game, you know, for the artistic gamble that it was. I mean, a trick with a movie like this is, is you have to make it at a reasonable enough cost 
that you can take some artistic swings. Certainly earlier in the process, earlier in my career, I had, you know, bigger studios interested in adapting the material, but they always wanted it to be, you know, something more mainstream, something more like the Hangover movies. And I love that, but that's not what I wanted to do with this. I, you know, they, I wanted to keep that thematic push. And in doing so, it was like, everyone was all in from the beginning. Definitely made it a little harder. I mean, certainly for me, but ultimately I was like, look, if I'm going to do this, I'm all in, you know? Yeah. You know, that, that I was thinking the, the um, exalted uh, position, occupied, regrettably vacant now, but occupied by Sam Shepard as playwright right. turned actor. Are you getting any Sam she Shepard comparisons or expectations? You know, you want to early, throw in my you? early in my career, I, I certainly did. I mean, I'm a huge fan of his. His plays are a little, you know, stranger than my material usually. His is very abstract, but like, I, you know, I always loved him. I loved how he had that career. It was able to sort of get those comparisons early on and see someone who had done it. Um, actually, one Thanksgiving, I was, I was in New York and a previous job I had with my wife and my very young daughter at this, this high-end restaurant called Craft that a friend of ours hooked us up with because we were stuck there for work. And next in the table right next to us was uh, Sam Shepard and Jessica Lang having, you know, a quiet uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And our daughter was having a rough night that night, like throwing shit around and stuff. It was pretty funny. I was like, that's my hero. Don't throw, you know, a drum <laughs> stick at him, please, honey. Uh, but yeah, for sure. I mean, look, it's it always helps when you... For me, especially, and where I came from, it, I, I think I've wasted a lot of my life early on waiting for permission mm -hmm. to do what I innately wanted to do. So someone like Sam Shepard, having already blazed that trail, was like a, certainly an inspiration for me. And then when this came up, it had just been a culmination of so many of years of being like, I'm done. I'm done not seizing what I want to do. Yeah. So I just I just went all in and it was never sort of an, a, a question for me. It was like, are you on the team? Because this is what we're doing. And obviously I had John Bernthal as a as a collaborator whose name carries a great deal of clout. And then when he believes in you, people kind of get in line. Yeah. Great. Well, I thought you did a great job in front of the camera. Uh, oh, thank as, you as well. So, yeah, really, really pulled it off. Um, I, I want to talk for a moment, if, if it's OK, about Stronger. Sure. Um, film that came out a couple of years ago with Dick Dylan Hall in the lead, uh, portraying real life uh, Boston Marathon bombing survivor uh, Jeff Bauman, and uh, you wrote the script for this, and um, very well, I think, critically acclaimed as well. I thought it was, I thought, you know, in the same way that you caught the the the, the cadences and the kind of the naturalness and the language and the life of of working class, you know, working class folks. Um, were you, you were picked, you were asked to write the thing or you did it on spec and tried to get it sold? No, that was, uh, so when I, I had started with new agents who was, who began to use small engine repair, the play as sort of my writing sample. And I have a, a companion piece to small engine repair called lost girls, which is sort of the same neighborhood, but it's female driven. It's not quite a thriller, but it's the same sort of themes explored. Um, so I had those two hit plays that were opening doors and those, the company Mandeville who were produced uh, stronger had, I just had a series of meetings with them and they just loved the plays and they, were, they loved the voice. They were always looking for something in that. And when the book excerpt for stronger or the proposal from it, it hadn't been published yet came out, they were saying, Hey, we love this. We've met the guy. We really like his book. It's, you know, we'll be able to send you a PDF in a couple of weeks of the, an advanced copy what do you think? And I was like, well, it's super compelling. Obviously I had my own personal Boston marathon story. I was at the finish line with my daughter 24 hours prior and we flew back um, and we're from there obviously. So I, I had a personal connection to it. And I was like, I'm very interested now, strangely at that point in my career, when you're first starting out, things are a lot more tailored to you. Like if someone's going to take a shot on me who hadn't done as much, it, it was because it's deeply in my lane. Now that I've been doing this enough, you get stuff thrown at you and inevitably you don't have as much time to curate it or read over it. And you're like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't get back in time. You know, you're just busier, but back then I wasn't as busy. So that came across my desk and I read the book and the book was very problematic cinematically, but it was more what wasn't in the book. And so the book was very quickly written hero tale for like an, an airport. And it was well done, but I was like, there's a lot more beneath the surface here. And in speaking with him, I said, you know, I know these characters, I know these archetypes, 
let me subvert it, subvert the book, which was just the beginning. And the, everyone was really open to that idea. So, you know, we put a pitch together and then the real work began, sold it to, uh, to Lionsgate at the time um, based on the strength of the pitch. And Scott Silver, who was a producer on that <laughs> movie, became like a mentor of me through that process a lot. You know, they do this sometimes when you have like a green writer, like I was at the time, they'll get like a, you know, a veteran a screenwriter to sort of produce it and oversee it. And like, you know, his whole thing was like, look, I'm going to, um, let me give you feedback to help you write a studio movie, which he did. And he, he and I hit it off so well, we've gone on to write a number of screenplays together and, and continue. Uh, I mean, he changed my life in terms of opening my head as to how, what a movie is. But uh, so I think then it was just a deep dive on research. And I grew up about 20 minutes away from Chelmsford and I just knew the guys I'm from there. So I think that I have no question that that familiarity gave me access into their lives that, you know, someone who was a gun for hire definitely would not have had. Yeah. Were um, you happy with the film, how the film translated your script and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I had such a great experience making the movie, you know, David Gordon Green, who became a dear friend, and we continue to work on stuff. You know, I shadowed him for majority of the movie. And I think it really informed my ability to direct small engine repair and, and you know, working with a number of directors over the years, you sort of cherry pick, but I had a great experience. Um, you know, it, it's tough in the sense of you work so hard on a scene and making it all click. And then on the day, things change due to the you know sound, the camera, some people improvising, some actors get changing lines or whatever. Um, but overall, I, I mean, I love the movie. You, you just have to kind of give that up. It's, you know, there's the movie you write, there's the movie that's shot, and then there's the movie that comes out. And that process had some pain here and there, but ultimately in seeing the movie as to what it was, and, you know, some like, I remember there was like a quarter page scene I wrote Actually, I, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, I had written the scene and then it was, and then as we were polishing it up to give it to Lionsgate, the producers, uh, like we, this is, we don't need this. We'll cut it. And I was like, sure. And I, it wasn't a scene I was going to die on the hill for. It was a hospital scene. And then we're shooting and all that. And I actually had to come back to do a pitch in LA. So I wasn't there, but David called me on the phone because I wasn't, you know, he loved having me there. We'd bounce off ideas, but I wasn't there. He's like, listen, he's like, I have an extra time. He's like, there anything in this hospital that we could uh, do and I was like oh my god and I sent him this like from my phone like this uh half page scene that we cut and they shot it and it was the best scene in the movie for me <laughs> so I was like oh my god you just never know uh so in terms of realizing what making a movie is and how organic it is as opposed to theater where you're chiseling out these battle tested moments that will work over and over again and they may always have a different reaction but the movie it's like you just gotta let it have a life and, and do its thing yeah, but I got I got to imagine you 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 labor over the words so carefully. Everything is so, you know, polished and crafted and honed and deliberate that to have someone improvise or to treat it casually on set, I I'd be so irked. I maybe you managed it okay, but I'd be so ticked off. I mean, it was, you know, you just got to take your ego out of it. I mean, you have to believe in creative Darwinism and say whatever is the best will work. That's and a good that's attitude. true. And, and you know, I, I learned that lesson on small engine repair and that, you know, a lot of I had my lines go and we were just so in it. And you got to if you have actors, especially who are so in it, like you have to identify the difference between an actor improvising because they don't know the lines. They were too lazy to do the work or they're too scared to go somewhere that the script is asking with to, to an actor like I had at small engine repair for certainly. And you look, you have with Jake Gyllenhaal and Tatiana and Natasha, I mean, uh, Miranda Richardson, stuff like that, where these actors are so deep in the character and they know the intent of the line and the intent of the scene. And they know what works that in the moment they have to make some decisions to sort of feather it all together. You know, and then by the way, then you edit it. And a lot of the stuff that they think is so cherry and they came up with the moment doesn't work. Yeah. Some of the stuff, some of those gems work and that's sort of the fun collaboration of it. But, you know, an actor is so deep in their character at that moment, it's up to you, you know, as the writer, especially as the director to say, what story are you telling? Like, let's just make sure we do this. And, you know, what I certainly did for Small Engine Repair, which I saw David do a lot. One of the things I sort of was like, that's how I want to be. Um, you know, let's get it. Okay, we got it, guys. I'm really happy with that. We got it. What do you want? You want to try anything? You want to try something different? And then do it. 
And sometimes you use that, sometimes you don't. But to create that collaborative thing, to be like, look, we have the, we have that story beat covered. Let's hit it from a different angle. So you're, you have that. So small edge repair, unlike Stronger, we didn't have the budget of Stronger. We didn't have a video village. We didn't have like time for playback and all that stuff. So you kind of just had to be more fluid. And I was like, I would rather shoot another take of something different than pause it and go look at the monitor and see how it looks. Right. Um, you know, Stronger, there's just a lot more moving parts, a lot more bigger budget, a lot more of that stuff. It wasn't sort of that claustrophobic, you know, uh, pressure cooker. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm super proud of the movie. I, you know, uh, look, I, you know, I wish that we had had a, a bigger marketing spend and I wish there'd been a bigger awards push for it. I, I, I lament that, but, you know, I think you make these things and you put them out and that's all you can do. Did you go to see the movie in a theater with, a, with, a, with an audience? Stronger? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was obviously pre-COVID. So there was a ton of, you know, Toronto premiere, there were like, you know, tons of Q&A screenings. It was back when people just regularly went to the movies at, at right, various right. little, you know, festivals and that type of thing. Um, premieres and stuff. They just, you know, they're not really doing that now, unfortunately. It must have been a thrill, though, to see your work up on the screen. It oh, it was, with it, was to it was totally a thrill. Yeah, I mean, it was great. You know, again, I come from theater where that's the bread and butter, where you use the audience, not just to sit back and enjoy it, although that's part of it, but you use that to also continue to refine the material and battle test it and see how far you can push it. And, you know, the, the audience, in, the audience has made me the writer that I am and having that feedback loop with the audiences in the theater. Mm. That's how I developed a voice. That's how I instinctually feel like I got to a point where I know how to write for an audience. And that translates into film to a large degree. And I suppose you can have a series of, you know, market tested films, which certainly David did for Stronger. We didn't really have that option for our movie due to finances and COVID, God damn it. But, um, you know, it's like not letting them say, oh, I was offended by that or I didn't get that. It's usually, I mean, you guys know this. It's usually like, I didn't get that. That was unclear. Those are the most helpful notes or what, mm -hmm. like, what was your intent on that? You know, um, anyway, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah. I know what I was yeah, talking yeah. about. But, but, you know, a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about uh, actors improvising. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, a lot of the dialogue in Small Engine Repair felt improvised, uh, which may be testimony to how carefully actually it was crafted and written and also the the naturalness and the you know the fluidity of of the actors but i'm pretty sure i will never be able to forget till the end of my life i forget now if it's i think it's packy's line or or swaino's line the 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 description of a of a corgi oh the corgi yeah, 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 yeah. as a, a regular sized dog with wicked short legs yes <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that sequence was taken verbatim from the uh from the play yeah i mean most of that you know it was uh again we had just sat and done so much table work that you know there was some filling in of stuff but most of it what look in, in theater you have to plant your feet on certain lines and you have to project it it's like can you can the audience hear that can they see you are you lit are everything so there's like a, a technique to it in, in film you don't want to plant your feet and say the funny line because it may, you know, it, it was more, you know, in talking about my influential films, I look at the scene of Goodfellas, you know, like you talking to me, I mean, I, I tell you, you, uh, you call me a clown, you know, that, like, yeah. I amuse you, like, like well, that scene. Um, I amuse you. I amuse you. <laughs> like you can't, you have to throw stuff away. You know, you have to just be like, not trying to be funny. Like those guys aren't, Sometimes they're trying to crack each other up, but most of the times it's just thrown away. Like it was interesting. I mean, I did it to myself. So much of the funny ass lines in the play and in the movie, like people who've seen the play and like, oh my God, they have their favorite lines. They see it in the movie and they're like, I heard the line, but like, it was like thrown away. You know what I mean? Um, which I love. So, cause movies you watch multiple times. And like I said, Goodfellas, it wasn't until the fifth time I saw it that I was like, oh my God, I need to hear that line. Like wanted to sort of put that stuff in. But, you know, when you really trust your actors um, and you love them and they're super talented, then the, um, they're not trying to improve the words. They're trying to create, continue to create discovery and, and make stuff because, you know, you have to find the right actor because some actors are terrible at improv improvising. All they'll do is say the F word 
as like, it's like their characters have Tourette's. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, in my experience, it tends to be that actors either over cry or over emote when you let them improv too much or they swear too much. Mm. But it, if they don't have a handle of the character. So with John Bernthal, obviously, who's a great improviser and he's very, very funny, he, but he knows the script. He can he can go in and out of it. You know, you're not not worried about that. I'm like, go play, try some new stuff. Some of the new stuff we did was great. But like, there was the day where we had him rapping. You know, mm. and uh, you know, we did a. It's just like John, can you come up with a rap? But I just want you to hit these story points. I want you to say something about how well endowed Packy is within the rap. So he came up with this whole rap. <laughs> so he gave me like four minutes of it, and you need to use this sliver. Now I'm not going to write a rap. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes right. you do that. But you're like, here's what I need to come across in that, um, you know. But it's it was so much about the relationships in that movie and, and throwing the dialogue that was very, in some cases, incredibly finely crafted to the exact letter, and then in some cases it was like, let's just mess it up. We have it. Let's just just play with it. And by the time we had finished editing, I don't even recall what the script was. In many cases, it took a life of its own. Right. You know, to your point of the the subtlety and the the intimacy of film acting versus stage acting. I read a piece once by a journalist who was following John Travolta around on, on the set. And they shot a scene and the, the journalist was shocked. They said, he's not doing anything. I, right. think they, I think they like had a conversation with the director and said, what, he, he's not doing anything. And the director said, no, wait till you see the rushes. Yeah. He says, it's in the camera. He knows how to, and then he watched the rest of, oh yeah, there it was. You can't even see it in, in, out here in, in the world of three dimensions. No, I, I, listen, I, I think I saw that um, on, you know, with Tatiana, because um, certainly Jake is a very visceral, vibrant actor who projects. And <clears throat> Tatiana, I'm sure has that in her, but her character choices on the day when you're shooting um, were, were inward and subtle. In particular, I'm thinking of a couple of scenes at the hospital where you're there in the day and you're like, wow, is she getting lost? Like, what's going on? And then you see it and you're like, mm -hmm. oh my God, mm -hmm. she's just so real. And the camera amplifies lies. And if you're just truthful in the moment and, and there's nothing more powerful for an actor to do than to listen. And you can actively listen. And it's a skill set that so many actors don't, they're just waiting for their line, but the best actors listen actively. And on stage, you can actively listen and you have to. And in film, you know, the best actors do. So, but I, I think it's, again, this is why casting, you know, look, the, the, the movie was, if I had $250 million, I wouldn't have gotten better actors. They were the best. A large part, you know, Deb Aquila, who's a good friend, who, you know, is a huge supporter of the arts, came in and got us access to certainly Sierra and Jordana, some people that, we wouldn't have otherwise had a lot more difficulty getting to. Um, you have to cast. That's why the cast is so important because if you have an actor who's doing in this movie and this actor's in this movie, then you're gonna have a hell of time editing it, you know? So, so to your point, if you just listen and you're there and, and you're not denying it, you know what your intent is, but you're just inventing it in the moment. You know, the best acting is trying to get something out of the other character, the other person. And you're not thinking about how I look when I say this or, or I, or I do this. So if you get those actors of that caliber who are trained and everybody in our movie was, I mean, even my wife who plays Dottie in the movie is like a seasoned stage actor. So you don't have a bunch of time. You show up, it's like literally four degrees out. We're shooting that outside scene. And I'm like, whatever you throw at her, because I've seen her do it on stage a hundred times, it's there. So you just start creating those, as a director, those spaces for those actors to, to just flourish and listen and Sierra was like, you know, a case study of that because we were all this testosterone, all the dudes hanging out and we had our thing. And she showed, you know, I think it was like three weeks into our four week shoot, two and a half weeks that Sierra showed up and did her thing. And the first thing is like, hey, let's sit at this table and these guys are busting your balls and give it back to them. She isn't bad an eyelash. She just jumps in, sockets in there and is there. This is and Sierra Bravo. Sierra Bravo, Play, yeah. Who plays Frankie's 16 year old daughter. And right. I thought she was, I thought she was terrific. She's amazing. I thought she was just terrific. I mean, so uh, we're going to shift gears in just a moment. Sure. But just to, to, to last, just to leave for our audience and our, our viewers and listeners, really recommend the Monster's recommendation to see Small Engine Repair. Really, really a fine film. Um, 
John, one, one thing that we enjoy doing is, uh, in the time remaining is we're speaking with our guests about uh, some of their favorite films. Great. Because it gives us insight into our guests or what, what they like. And of course, you know, we get to, to kind of swap insights and stories. So you mentioned a couple of films and one, uh, one of them was uh, Spike Lee's uh, Do the Right Thing. Um, right. Tell us why that makes <laughs> your favorite list. I, I mean, I, listen, I, I'm a big Spike Lee fan, but I felt, uh, you know, I thought, I think the, the movie is beautifully made. And I felt when I saw that, um, it was not an environment that I grew up in. I did not grow up in a particularly diverse area, but it really made me feel like I think the best movies can is, is, is in someone else's skin. And, um, and I, I just love how that movie gets to such complicated, it, it asks a lot of questions, but it doesn't say it knows all the answers. It's creating a discussion. And I, I just love that it did that. And the style and the energy, and it feels like New York City and it doesn't pander to audiences and every character in there just pops and is vibrant. I felt like it it just captured energy in a bottle. I mean, I watched that, that movie over and over again, but I didn't feel, you know, I think this is a misconception. Like if a movie is finally made, you don't feel excluded for not being a part of that demographic. I wasn't like, I'm not an inner city black guy. I'm not gonna like this movie. No, it's like, I'm a film fan and a human being. And we found the collective humanity and specificity of that neighborhood. And I, I mean, look, I remember seeing that because I'm Italian and I was like, oh my God, why did he throw that, that trash can through the window? My, like I was thinking about that for days and rewatching it over and over again. And I was like, it's on me. The onus is on me to sort of understand that and look at it at a different point of view because I was so conditioned to movies having a, a tidy ending. You know, I realized that how much more resonant that is. So, you know, again, in terms of small engine repair and what I wanted to do, Spike Lee's, that movie was very influential to me because I was like, I still think about it because it was so messy and complicated of an ending and didn't let me off the hook. So that that was specifically what what always resonates me about that movie. I mean, it's endlessly quotable, the music, you know, Public Enemy, all those characters are incredible. Um, yeah, and then when I moved to New York City, as I grew up, you know, got out of high school and stuff and lived there, I started to say, wow, this is authentic. This is so mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. It's not a film, you know. Uh, anyway, I, that's one of my favorites. Another of your favorite films you mentioned is Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven mm -hmm. with uh, Clint Eastwood and Gene Hackman. And that is, that, is a, that is a great film as well. I'm interested to kind of hear your take on that. And what was it about that that I mean, I've, I've, I've seen that movie so many times and it changes so often. Um, I mean, when I first saw that, I was pretty young. I was out on a date, but it, it I knew it was about something, even though I didn't know what it was about. That's and not not a great date film. No. Well, I had a cool date. She liked it. <laughs> um, we went to like an art house that was we were in college. So we we're a little more adventurous. But oh, good. it was, uh, you know, I, I just think that that movie was about something. It was so thematically rich. And I've watched it so many times since then. And I just think the script and the acting and the action and the way it unfolds and just that, that, that culmination to that final scene where they have awoken this monster and how morally ambiguous it is and how as the audience you're thirsting for blood, but then you get it. And it really just, I loved how complicated it was to subvert the genre, but then also deliver on those genre elements. So I just go back to it again and again, like uh, it's just so you know, one of those few movies that just builds towards this finale that satisfies on so many, so many levels. And uh, I just think the craftsmanship on it is fantastic, the way it's shot, everything. Yep. The, the, the scene after the, 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 the kid uh, participates in his first killing. Yeah, and after by the all, tree. Yeah, by the tree. After all his boasting and macho posing and all that, and then to see how devastating it is, how com completely traumatic the reality, and the and how unheroic, you know, they 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 shoot this guy while he's taking a dump in the in yeah. the outhouse, and and that scene where the kid is is crying and trying to justify to himself, you know, well, he had it coming, and Clint Eastwood. Would, we all got it coming, kid. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's so great. It's, it's, he, Clint is such, his character is such an archetype, but so real. You yeah. know, I think what interested me in cinema originally 
was these archetypes, these Indiana Jones characters, Star Wars, all of these larger than lives. All of my first scripts were so derivative of other movies. And then you realize, okay, when it's done well, you, when you create a human being out of the archetype, and in his case, he's the, 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 you know, the movie's asking the audience is like, you think Westerns, like when a bullet goes into someone's body, it does horrifying things, yeah. you know, teeth blast out the back of the head, all of that stuff. I was like, holy shit. Like it's, it's really putting a spotlight on us as an audience and you know, our, our relationship with violence, you know, and I, I just blew me away. Continue. Oh, doesn't hurt having Morgan Freeman and Gene Hackman in your supporting <laughs> cast. And, and yeah. you talk about the moral ambiguity, you know, Gene Hackman, it's such a great role for him. Gene Hackman, yeah. his little bill is that, you know, corrupt um, lawman, but he's got the, you know, he's got the, the authority and the protection yeah. of the law on his side. Um, a, a parable for our times. <laughs> he's built, he's like, I'm building a house. I can't die. I'm building a house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is a great film. Yeah. It's good. Would you care to talk for a moment, John, about any current or future projects? Uh, you know, man, it's so tricky with these things. Like, I'm not sure what I can talk about. I'm developing a TV dream project. I feel really good about. I, I just, it hasn't been announced. I don't think I can get into it. Maybe when we hang up, I'll tell you about it. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm working on the Hulk Hogan movie with Scott Silver um, mm -hmm. for Netflix, which is awesome. I'm digging on that. And then I'm starting, uh, about to start a new cool movie that hasn't been announced yet, but I'm writing it for John. So, you know, he and I have a whole bunch of cool stuff uh, in the works, that that being one of them. And then, yeah, man, I mean, like, I'm paranoid about this stuff because okay, you know, well, I, never, I, like, I never understand why sometimes you do a project and it's like in the trades and like Hulk Hogan, everyone talks about that. And then I've done so many things that like that never comes out. And so I'm like, I don't know how that works. So if it's not like published, I'm like, I'm just not going to say anything. Okay, we won't, we won't jinx it either. Can, can, can we ask you this? Is, is sure. the film with Hulk Hogan or about Hulk Hogan? I'm sorry, explain the difference. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think, Dean, I think Chris Hemsworth is attached to play the part. Is that right, Don? Yeah, that's correct. So it's, a, it's about Hulk Hogan. Oh, yeah, he's the central character. He's, he's the character, he's a, but he's, he's not acting in the film. Oh, no, like is Hulk Hogan acting in the film? Yeah. Well, that's a spoiler, so I, I can't really. Oh, okay. okay. No, I'm joking. He's not. It's Chris Hemsworth. Okay, great. Good. Okay, so we're looking forward to more diverse, surprising things from you. Well, thanks. We got a, we got a bunch cooking, so I'm really excited to be on your show again in a year Good. or two. Well, we will we will love to have you back in time, Don. This has been really, really fun and delightful. I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on the Philosopher's Movie Talk Show. Please subscribe to stay up to date on our newest episodes.